the Pediatric Lounge, a podcast taking you behind the door of the Physician's Lounge to get a deeper insight into just what docs are talking about today. From the clinically profound to the wonderfully routine and everything in between. And hello again. This is Dr. Herb Bravo and Dr. George Rogo. And today we have the pleasure of having a conversation with Dr. Dina Guriel, an internal medicine doctor specialist who is now a social media entrepreneur. We are going to talk about reframing how a doctor looks at social media and using it to their advantage and how she has created somedocs.com. Please welcome Dr. Coriel. Hi, George. Good to see you. Hey, Herb. Uh, it's Tuesday morning, once again, elevating great physicians. Today, we have another great, Dr. Dana Coriel, um, and she's going to talk to us about SOMIDOCS. It's not medicine, but it's very important in medicine. And we're going to talk about reframing how the doctor looks at social media and using it to their advantage. What about that? Welcome, Dana. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here and to talk about everything that I love. Great. Dana, you you started your career as a physician in Israel, going to medical school there. Then you came to residency in the West Coast? No. So I um, I grew up in Israel. Um, I then uh, immigrated here when I was 10 to the West Coast. Um, I went to UCLA for undergrad, to medical school at Sackler in Israel, and then I came back to the New York area for residency training at Albert Einstein uh, in Montefiore. So that's how I made it over to the East Coast. You're kidding me. I went to Montefiore also. Oh, wow. Yeah, remember the brown zone? (laughs) All the way in the back. I don't, actually, but I remember that there were firms, and I was in firm three. (laughs) I don't know. It It must have been later. Yeah. So in, interners and pediatricians are like cousins, right? <laughs> we deal That's with right. We're all generalists. We, do, we yeah. deal with the same thing. Uh, we are, I, I think we're specialists, but we just deal with different ranges of ages. Um, but it is a tough uh, world out there for the internist and the pediatrician. Um, where did you get this knack for design? When I look at your websites, you, you have a personal website and then you have so many dogs. Uh, the pictures, the design, everything is so sharp. It kind of just jumps out of you um, when you're looking at it. It's, you know, I, it reminds me of Steve Jobs. It's like looking at an Apple website. There's, there's absolutely uh, total attention to every detail, every pixel. Um, how do you get to be that good? First of all, thank you so much. Before I forget to thank you, um, I'm laughing to myself. I'm laughing to myself because I have like an ongoing running joke with my father-in-law about um, my attention to detail. Um, there was like some incident with photographs like years ago when I think it was when we used to take out um, photos from the photo making place. Like we would use actual cameras, and I remember they like botched the film or something, and I was upset that there wasn't care and attentiveness um, given to my film. And since then, he always he always laughs at me and brings that up, um, especially as I grow a business where attention to detail is important. So you picked up on something that is important to me. I think attention to detail is important in life. And I think, I actually think that's what made, when I was a practicing internist, which was three year, up to three years ago, that's what I think made me a good doctor was attention to details. Um, you know, it's attention to details that can help us to pick up on the most minute of um, like hints to illness um, or to how a patient could be feeling and may not be expressing themselves. Um, I've just always had that awareness. Um, sometimes I call myself a, a very like a, like a, a especially sensitive person. Um, I forgot the term for that, OSP, ESP, but there's actually a term for very sensitive people. That said, I love art. Um, I've always been, you know, drawn to the arts. And I think I've just always had a knack for design. I just never like did anything with it. 
And my story goes, and if you've listened to me, you probably know my story already. My story goes that I took three years off to be with my son, with my third son to give birth to him. And when I did, um, I had time stepping away from medicine to discover all these talents that I had, or at least hobbies that, <clears throat> that I loved. And I never had time to explore when I was practicing medicine. Wow. Very interesting. Um, and so can you tell us what the importance of creating content in the digital world is uh, like, especially for physicians today? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. It, it's such a good question. and such an important question. And it's got so many answers. <laughs> so I'm almost in my head thinking to myself, like, where do I focus first on how to answer? I mean, at the base of it all lies this concept of marketing, right? We all need to market ourselves in society. In the world of today, we need to market ourselves, whether we like it or not. Physicians traditionally have always been marketed. We just haven't marketed ourselves. We, especially as of late, would work for an employer, a large hospital system, many of us, and they would market for us. So we would rely on that indirect marketing um, and their sort of bringing in patients um, for us to be sure that we have a job. Um, physicians are increasingly looking at alternative uh, methods of practicing uh, and in private practice specifically, and you've got to market yourself there. Um, I live in the New York City area and here there's a ton of academic centers, especially here, right? It serves as a great example because you've got to market how you stand out for what you do and the services you provide from your competitors. So if you're a physician that works near Columbia or near Cornell, right? You've got, and you're in private practice, you've got to convince the public why they would should come to you over going to these other really large academic centers. And again, that's just one little example. Yeah. But there's bigger examples like impacting your career positively, getting speaking gigs, getting advisory board positions, getting asked to do things. And you don't even have to want to do those things, but having those opportunities thrown at you is just a fantastic way to expand your career and to at least have the opportunity to say yes or no, whereas you wouldn't if you did not market or promote yourself. So, so I'm going to uh, circle back a little bit because I'm going to push back against some of what you said. Um, so one, I don't think the health system markets any physician. The health system markets themselves and they try to commoditize every physician so they can replace us if possible with a uh, medical assistant with no training, uh, oh, wow. keep, the, keep the profit for themselves. That's so I have zero argument there. Like I am so on board with that. In fact, I invite everybody that's listening to read some of the articles I've written. You can find all those articles on doctors on social media.com. Just search for Donna Coriel for my name, and you can go into my profile and see the articles I've written. I've written articles that literally mirror what you just said. Um, just off the top of my head, I've written something called the something like the healthcare joysticks play on. And in it, I describe how each of us, the physicians, um, is a pawn in a game that the organizations are playing. And we have become replaceable pawns. Um, and it is to the detriment of the patient because we are not, in fact, we should not be replaceable pawns. We should be members of society that are valued and they have succeeded in the last many years in devaluing us in, I don't wanna say a smear campaign because honestly like we're their superstars and we you know, run the, us and the other healthcare workers, by the way, nurses are just as important, but the healthcare staff runs the system and then the system benefits. So I do agree for you. Um, what I meant is they market us as an extension of them. So it would be very much like a movie that would not succeed if of George Clooney or Brad Pitt starred in it, but once George, George Clooney and Brad Pitt star in it, it takes it to the next level and gives it value. And so it's worth that much more. You know, think of, about it even in um, like movies, okay? Star Wars, okay? The old Star Wars with the actors and everybody, it was fantastic. 
Then they they went then they did the prequels. They had one episode of Star Wars, I think it was Rogue One, where there was nobody that was famous, no actor, no old actors, no new actors, just regular people where they all died at the end. The movie itself, with all the graphics and the explosions and the, and the spaceships, it was fantastic. It was a Star Wars movie, but there was no actors in there. So I think that's what they're doing to us. They're just making the nice hospital place with people. That's stuff. exactly what it is. I always compare physicians to actors, um, not because we're actors and not because we're acting or pretending, quite the opposite, but in the 30,000 foot entrepreneurial view of things, it's easier for physicians to understand our role in the healthcare system by thinking of ourselves as actors. Um, to some degree, we are the celebrities of healthcare because when the patient comes to the hospital, they're coming for the amazing um, physicians and the nurses and the actual staff. They're not coming because it's a, a, a certain hospital. Now, I mean, hospitals have been able to build a brand for themselves um, that's associated with, you know, great quality, et cetera, et cetera. But that's all on them building that up. And that's kind of the basis of what I do now is teach physicians that we individually can build up that same um, uh, quality, right? That same brand. And that sort of is the basis of building a personal online brand is what the hospital did, what the hospitals do for themselves as systems. You should 100% be considering to do for yourself. Yeah, so, so I'm going to, again, circle back a little bit and level set a little bit because you're much younger than I am. Um, but when I started practicing, uh, when was that? 1992. What were your marketing options? You could send flyers to families that were moving into the area. You could, and this, you're going to, you probably don't know what this is. You, there was a yellow book and yeah. people would brand their practice with, to start with three A's. Because the way the, the phone book used to list you was by alphabetical order. Yeah. So if your practice was AAA pediatrics, You'd be first. that was the first one. And people would open the phone book and look for pediatricians or internists, uh, whatever it was. Um, and maybe there was a local paper that you could put an ad on. Um, you know, not, not like the Washington Post and the New York Times, a community paper. Yeah, and, and the wherever you world. wherever you prayed, you know, church, synagogue, whatever it is, they usually had a flyer at the end of you know for every week, and sponsors and every dentist, internist, pediatrician, uh, lawyer, realtor that went to that congregation bought an ad to support the church. Right. Now, that's totally gone. Now we live in the age of uh, Facebook is for old people. Well, I would say, I would actually say that it's not necessarily gone. It's just taken on a different form. Um, and I'll just take my own community as an example. I mean, instead of the local newspaper, you've now got a Facebook group for like Tenafly, New Jersey, right? I mean, every region now is communicating online. Um, and so the channels, like the mediums through which we marketed our practices, are not gone, they just have evolved um, in order to fit in with the methods of communication of today. And that's the basis of what I do now. That's the basis of myself being like a digital innovation expert is recognizing that 10 years ago and building up ways um, that doctors can understand that. Uh, we teach regularly, um, building up ways that doctors can leverage that. Uh, we have tools that uh, doctors can use to increase their visibility um, and increasing ways to facilitate connections with doctors for the rest of the world. Because part of what Somi Docs does and part of what I recognized that I needed to disrupt is the fact that the world was starting to follow the non-doctors that were becoming savvy online. Um, and I'll even say have more time on their hands online to like really perfect their marketing and are succeeding in swaying um, the rest of the world in following them. And you get things like pseudoscience going on and you get um, you know people walking through our doors saying things through no fault of their own that they believe in that are not necessarily true, but they cannot discern 
whose websites are real doctors and whose aren't, or what they're reading online, whether it's real, whether it isn't. And at least when I was practicing, I mean, it would prolong visits to have to convince them that what they've read is not exactly right, or at least, well, let's try it this way first. And then like, let's not jump to conclusions and expose you to, you know, unnecessary radiation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I see hesitancy has become huge because of the internet. People read, you know, how many people don't want to take the HPV, the MMR? They don't even know why. I heard something. That's the usual answer. They don't have an intelligent answer. Well, they also see, they also read anecdotal things. I mean, the media is great at serving us anecdotes, right? Here's a case of someone that got paralyzed because of XYZ or, and I'm not even talking just about that in general, right? And it, propagates fear and it propagates fear you know to read anything to read that the local you know child that played soccer got injured um heavily injured and my children play soccer and i know that that affects me it's just it, it's a it's human nature yeah. to react to these stories that really um hit your emotions uh, so absolutely that that the the new york times and the washington post live by creating fear um, that's how they sell papers. I'm going to circle back at something you've said or touched upon tangibly many times now. Um, I think part of what the health systems were trying to do for a long time was um, fracture the community of physicians. So as long as I'm not talking to you, I'm not talking to George, I'm not talking to the obstetrician, I'm not talking to the orthopedist, then I just, I'm told what practice to refer to. And that's where I send in then we are all weaker because we never network. And I understand that's one of your passions is through putting people together in a virtual space to get them eventually to network together at events so that we regain some of that humanity. And then when somebody asks you, who's a good pediatrician in Long, Long Island? Because my cousin's moving there. You can say, oh, you know, you should go to RBK Pediatrics. They do really good work. Um, and that's all gone. I mean, it used to be that you had dinner with the obstetricians because they, they sent you babies and you would show up to the delivery room because they were worried about the baby and you would shoot, you know, the bull, excuse my language, a little bit with the, with the other doctors to ask about the kids and then you go back home and go to bed. That's all gone. Um, so tell me more about how you're trying to network and put this together, not only in the digital world, but in the real world. Yeah, so that's a huge passion of mine. You're right, is networking. Um, I believe that for many, many years, we have been siloed and we've been separated from one another and it has harmed our profession because we cannot then identify what it is that's afflicting us as a profession. Um, if I'm suffering, um, I, and, and also it's the way that we've been trained. I mean, we've been trained to deal with a lot, to put up with a lot. Um, and it really affects the progress of our profession. And it allows those from the outside um, to do things to us that we feel could be um, like, like that we're, we're dealing with, like we need to deal with, right? You need to be stronger. Um, you need to put up with that. Um, and doctors go through such an arduous process to become a doctor that it almost becomes like, well, if I don't put up with that, then I'm weak. But once we connect with one another and get got together online, we suddenly realize that we're not weak, that others are frustrated and sometimes even suffering as we are. And I say suffering, not because I'm looking for attention, but because doctors are actually committing suicide and we're increasing in the rates of our suicide. And I think this is something to start talking about. Um, so yeah, I think we have been siloed and my efforts is to bring us together. Now, a great question to ask me, and I'm going to ask myself is right. why not just feel good about the existing spaces online that bring us together. And I will tell you why. I'm actually um, giving some lectures, some live lectures about social media and the way it works. And one of my upcoming lectures is about Facebook and how Facebook groups work. 
I specifically call it how to monetize Facebook groups because I think it's important for us to understand why people would take the time to run Facebook groups. So how does it, for example, make the money, right? Um, but what I saw that needed to be disrupted are existing Facebook groups that were being influenced, right? Not Facebook groups where you could purely network regardless of what your political affiliation is, regardless of what you believe in, regardless of whether you paid the admin or not, or regardless if uh, whatever it is that you needed, a space where doctors are gathered together and where there's some rules and structure that applies to everyone. You don't see that much nowadays online. I mean, there's some groups where it's fairly straightforward, but for the most part, um, there's no clear cut rules and they usually do not apply to any, to everyone, understandably, because the admin probably does a lot of the work because it takes a full-time job sometimes to run a Facebook group. But it was important to me to build a networking space where the admin is not skewing the conversation and where everyone is allowed to at least drop comments, for example, um, and follow certain rule sets and not have their comments be deleted. That, that bothers me tremendously, like to my core, I am a fair person. Yeah, her gets deleted every other day. <laughs> yeah. <well. laughs> uh, so, um, so yeah, that's a very important work you're doing. I, I think that bringing physicians together, that's part of the mission of the pediatric lounge is yeah. um, allow physicians uh, to express what's going on and, and build community and be able to make new friends and reach out to each other. To your point, um, we just had a, a mastermind on uh, suicide prevention and women physicians are killing themselves with handguns at a higher rate than any other demographic. Um, and that's just shocking. And we have another colleague who was following a four month old baby um, whose mom was uh, uh, had severe substance abuse problems. And, you know, they had the government involved and everything and the baby turned out dead. Um, and the frustration one feels as a pediatrician, you know, you, I can't really take that baby and take it home. I, I can't do that. But you know, you call, you call social works, you try to involve as many people and you still have an outcome where somebody is dead when they shouldn't be dead, um, is absolutely, it, it destroys you as a human being. It doesn't matter how it can much change. And especially if, if it can be changed, like in your circumstance, you're talking about something where our hands are somewhat tied. Um, but in medicine, our hands aren't tied. Like that is an adult human that I, I don't know. I don't know why people kill themselves. Everyone's got their own reasons, obviously, and they're obviously reached a brink, a, a, a brink point. But what if, you know, we could have intervened somehow as a profession? Or what if we had gone together as a group and allowed that person to know that they're loved or to, to understand that there's an out from medicine, that medicine is not just about practicing in an office and that's part of what I'm trying to do is indirectly like give options to doctors, right? By building Sony Docs, and we haven't even talked about all the resource it has, resources it has, but there's so many options for doctors nowadays. They just don't know about those options. They don't know what other doctors are doing and they don't know um, how they could improve their private practice, maybe to get more patients to come so that they can stay up um, or that it's okay to advocate for change and how you can do that within a system or outside of the system. So that's you're what Sony Docs is doing. So you're absolutely right. So, so I, can't, I can't take the pain away from my friend, but the fact that he could express that in a list server where he won't get canceled. And yes. several people reached out back and said, we're so sorry, that's, that's a horrible experience, but you did all you could. That lessens the pain of that impact. 100%. Well, it's, it's all about human connection and all about support. The so, relationships. Yeah. And again, like, I think there's different levels of networking and levels of support. I mean, there's different niches. There's different niches to each community that lives online, right? Like some of us need a community where we can 
find support. And some of us need a community where we can share our podcasts. And some of us need a community where we can throw out ideas about businesses or a community to talk about social media, et cetera. Um, the issue that I find, okay, so we need it and it's here. And now doctors are smart and motivated and building those communities. The issue I have as a doctor is, well, okay, where do I find those communities? Like, how can I, other than a word of mouth that I might randomly be landing on, how can I find that coveted resource without having to wait three years to have my colleague in passing tell me about it? That's one of the things Somidox is doing. It's disrupting by building a library and categorizing like what is out there for doctors and where can I find it? So we have even like a, we have a beyond exam room section where there's a communities tab. And in that communities tab, any doctor that has built a community can for free, by the way, build, a, have us build, they don't even have to build it. We do the work, fill out a form about your community, send it in. We will build you a landing page. And now it's all categorized. We do all the tech work. When I say we, it's me, it's all me. I do all the tech work. I make sure that it's showcased. I'm just asking for some collaborative effort. And there's been doctors that love it and come in and say, I am all for collaboration and I want so many docs to grow and I want to grow. Those are the doctors that I'm looking for. There's plenty of doctors out there that do not want so many docs to grow and want to sort of keep everyone's eyeballs because it's an attention economy and eyeballs equal money. Um, but unfortunately, I'm hoping that this way will at least help all of us grow and allow a doctor to land somewhere and be like, all right, let me search for the community that I'm interested in. So on so many docs, a, a physician can just sign up and make a profile there. Yes. So that's the newest feature is until now, we've only had paid membership because we needed to raise money and it was either raising money through venture capital or raising it through the docs. Um, I wish it was quicker in raising money through the docs. We kept the cost really low. I, I think it's there's a disconnect because it's hard for doctors to realize just how valuable it is, A. And B, I don't have the millions of dollars it takes to market online um, that a company nowadays needs to have. And so I count on doctors telling their friends, hey, there's this site called doctorsonsocialmedia.com. And it is really cool. And it, it, it basically looks to help us grow. It serves as our publicist and our PR machine. So right now we've switched and there's an, a free option. Doctors apply for a free profile membership and we take the time to vet them to make sure that they are the doctors they say they are. And then they get onto a wait list and we open it up in chunks every little while and bring a whole slew of docs in so that we can build them profiles. Now, there's not enough time in this podcast to even talk about what you get for the profile. It is not like a Facebook or a LinkedIn profile. It is much more. It is a magazine style profile. It's built by hand. It is unique to you. Um, it showcases you. Um, it's publicly accessible to the world. Um, and there's now a way for the world to connect with you without knowing your email. So it is working like a publicist and who could be getting in touch with you ideally. Ideally, it's journalists that are looking for quotes from real doctors. It shouldn't be hard. It, it, it shouldn't be that they put it out and the doctors come scrambling for them. They can find exactly who they need on SomiDocs by filtering out the specialty, by filtering out what you do on the side, et cetera by businesses that are maybe looking to work with someone, including with influencers. If you like that word, someone who's on Instagram, hey, I wanna work with someone who has a YouTube channel. You can filter that out on Sony Docs. Um, businesses and startups looking for advisors, an advisory board that's unique, not the same player every time. Same with events that are looking for speakers. Hey, I want to look for a speaker for my event that's not the same person that's making its rounds. Let me go into the speaker section of so me docs and look through the docs and and even look at a snippet of them talking and decide if it's worth it maybe the doctor can even choose to put their compensation there if they for example don't want to get out of bed for less than whatever to talk it's all transparent and it's all free and seamless and quick wow. so, so, so that sounds very interesting but i'm going to uh, circle back um 
kind of get us back into where we were supposed to be talking about. Uh, <laughs> well, you have to make but, a profile. I made a profile on Solvi Docs. You got to get a profile now. But um, the the what I what I want to touch upon, and maybe we just just touch three points um, that are important, right? Keep it simple. Um, why is it important to own your own brand? And it doesn't matter if you're a dentist, a lawyer, a doctor, a real estate agent. And what are the three things that you should have to own your own brand? Okay, let me, I'm just going to write down brand because I'm going to go on off on, there's so many ways to answer this and so many things to say. I need to really just focus on a few points. So owning your own brand is important because nowadays, especially with what we talked about, about systems almost like owning you, you've got to own yourself. So just like a celebrity in a movie, right, needs to own themselves, you want to be able to make other movies. You want to be able to lift up from one movie and go to another movie. You want to lift up from a system and go to another system freely. If it doesn't work out or if they are abusive to you or you do not agree with their rules about referring to just their people, <laughs> And for whatever reason, you need to leave and go to a new system. You should be able to not only do that physically, but you should be able to take your intellectual property with you. So the podcast you built, for example, to make it more hitting home, the podcast you built while you were working for company X should 100% be yours to take with you when you go to company Y. The problem is, is that there's it's a gray zone because hospitals are smart. And so they could theoretically say to you, well, no, you are working for me and your um, contract said X, Y, and Z. And so we now own a part of that. And guess what? You're screwed. <laughs> you can't really argue with that. So yeah. 10 years ago, when I started this, I built it into my contract and I knew that building a brand was important for me. Now, brands were new. I mean, I could tell you that my lawyer at that time was like, what the hell are you talking about? And I was like, Trust me, right in there that that's my brand. And that's what I think doctors are not understanding and need to be smarter about is I know that you don't think of yourself as a celebrity because you're a humble person, but you are a celebrity, you're a celebrity of health. Um, and there are external factors that will control you if they can. And you've got to dot your I's and cross your T's. You got to own that brand. Okay. So, so let's, let's level set a little bit. So what, you know, her Bravo MD. So, so the first thing is own that domain and you can Absolutely. do that on Google for $15, right? Own, own exactly. your need. You own your domain and consider, this isn't a must, but consider owning domains that are similar to it, like herbbravo.com or bravomd.com or drherbbravo.com. 15 bucks a year. Um, and you could do with it what you want. You could even build one website up and redirect the other two to go to that one website. Okay. The, the second step would be, every, I think every physician should now be in LinkedIn. Um, it's just important. But there's so many avenues, but you should have a website that puts all your content in place. And it can be simple, not as beautiful as yours. And, I... then, you want, and then you want to partner with people like you uh, yes. So that, you know, you have uh, a publicist to grow your brand. So I agree with you 100%, but I look at it. I frame that differently. Okay. The website is a must for me. It's prime real estate property because it's yours. I'm sorry. My Alexa's going off. I don't know why it doesn't like what I'm talking about, about owning yourself. <laughs> um, you need to own the prime real estate property and that's your website. You own the URL. It's yours. You could do with it what you want. I view LinkedIn and Somidocs, they're not the same at all, but I still view them in the same way in the functions they serve for an individual brand and doctor, okay? They are merely marketing outlets in the online highway, right? So your website is yours. You're going to be looking at what channels are quick and, and, and unique and available for me to market my contact so that my, I'm sorry, my content so that I get eyeballs to come back to my site. And LinkedIn serves as a conduit at the end of the day. You want to generate excitement about who you are 
and people can either contact you directly or come back, ideally come back to your website so they can remain warm leads and they can continue being there for all of the rest of the messages that you uh, send out on your website. Same with SomiDocs, right? You right. want the same thing happening. You want our collective marketing effort, the magazine that's in SomiDocs, the portfolios that are in SomiDocs that feature you, the profiles, you want them to generate, you want the eyeballs generated there. You want to share those eyeballs and convince them that your work is enticing enough to come to you, to your website. That's the premise. That's how link, that's how LinkedIn works too. I mean, again, I LinkedIn is my favorite social media platform, but let's call it what it is. It's an entrepreneurial venture that is still right run by someone else and not you. And I say that because again, I love LinkedIn, um, but it is slowly becoming a bit more like a Facebook. And again, understandably, they've got to keep the roof up above their heads. There's got to be money. It's run uh, like an entrepreneurial venture. So I'm starting to see things pop up on my notifications that I didn't ask for. Um, I'm starting to see sometimes that I don't get notified of things. And that reminds me a lot of Facebook because Facebook is extremely frustrated. I, I don't get notified of things. I My own group um, things that are happening there are not notified to me. And so it just keeps reminding us why it's important to build your own space and why you need to be a part of a venture where you agree with a structure and where people get you. Right. Absolutely. And then um, what's the importance of video today in today's digital world? Very. So I, I love video. Um, it's very important it connects you with other human. I mean, it's a double-edged sword like anything else on social media. Um, obviously it's a double-edged sword because you could rub someone the wrong way or say something wrong. And you will, <laughs> if you get successful enough and have enough followers and have enough traction, you will um, get people to be resentful of you and get haters, et cetera, whether it's something you said or your success rubs people the wrong way. The point is that um, video is spectacular because it's one step beyond the written word, right? You can read what people say, um, but video shows you their nuances, their facial expressions. You can pick up many times uh, authenticity if they mean things, et cetera. Um, video is, to me, video is king. It's just harder to do. And so... Um... The number one search engine in the world is Google, and the number two place is YouTube. So if you're trying to build your brand, you better have a YouTube channel, right? Well, that's, so first of all, yes. I mean, yes to the fact that I feel everyone should be on as many social media platforms as possible, because again, think of it like ads for your content. Um but no, because YouTube's hard to work and video is hard to do and not everyone wants to the limelight. I mean, my husband's an example. He's a practicing successful cardiologist and he doesn't, um, he doesn't like the limelight. He's just, he's not that celebrity. He just doesn't love it. So he would never do a YouTube channel and he would never feel comfortable doing it um, as much as he wanted. I mean, I guess they're never say never, but, um, but I do absolutely teach doctors um, this concept of your website is where you should be building your content. That's important to say, right? And from there, sprinkle it out to social media. Don't post it on LinkedIn and say goodbye, okay? Because then LinkedIn owns it, right? I mean, LinkedIn has it. It doesn't really, but it has it. And it's like, okay, but attention economy, they're getting that attention. Write it on your website, and then sprinkle it into LinkedIn, into the SomiDocs, or submit it as a SomiDocs article, put it on Facebook, put it on Twitter, but don't just focus on LinkedIn because there's so many other spaces online that may have followers that will be converted into following you. Great. What we did, what we did with our videos, like for example, this video, we have the podcast, which is audio. People listen to it in the car. We have video. We created a, a pediatric lounge um, YouTube channel, and then from there, I take a, I share the hyperlink and I drop it into YouTube. I'm sorry, into uh, LinkedIn, to Facebook, 
um, and whatever the different groups that I'm part of. So, so, so I love that. And to you, I say, if I could like give, you know, let's just off the cuff, give a tip. Okay. Um, I would say for the doctors that are doing it, first of all, great job. I think you're leveraging and you're recycling. And that's the key to success is really just recycling so that you put in less effort um, and you get a bigger bang for your box. So a bigger return on your time investment. My tip would be um, that to make sure that when you put like the YouTube in the social media spaces to add, to still add like a tidbit of writing to it and not just say like, check it out. Look at my video. Like no one's going to click in it. What you need to do is take out something enticing from your video and include it up on the top or ask a question, right? Because social media works through activity. The way these platforms work is that they, the algorithm favors those posts that are being, uh, that are popular, that are active. So you want people engaged. And so that's sort of the difference. And that's something very crucial that not every doc understands when they're building these YouTube videos. Well, great. So you've built a movie, but like, what's, where's the preview? Like what's going to entice me to watch your video? And so that's, you know, really important concept and it adds more work to us, but hopefully we can learn together by going to my lectures and things like that, how to recycle those previews and then how to like brainstorm as an, a physician incubator, how to brainstorm through making our work more enticing through marketing. I think you just touched on a very important point. It's not enough to recycle. Every media, uh, social media platform has a different algorithm and a different way which they play. And the time suck is putting that preamble to the video. You know, what's important, what you're going to say in, in Twitter is a little different that you're going to, you know, that what you can say in Instagram, and it's a little bit different of what your message is going to be on LinkedIn. And so um, doing that and tagging people to get eyeballs to look and share and like uh that can take you know uh, for one video uh it could take you the better part of the morning if you're doing it right uh just putting in three or four platforms embedded and embedding it into the website um it's a lot of work it's not just put it out there and i'm done no that i mean anybody can do that i can i can take i can take my iphone record myself say something stupid and put it into the my youtube channel nobody's gonna look at it um, That's what people look at, <laughs> the stupid things. Uh, but I don't know, know about doctors, though. I mean, you've seen plenty of doctors do silly things. Yeah, but they built they built an audience by sometimes, um, you know, straddling that line between no longer being a professional and straddling a line between um, no longer being a physician but just being a uh, personality on YouTube with 300,000 likes. Um, yeah, there's, there's definitely a fine line of, you know, doing it right, but still being a professional. Yes. Oh, and I you, completely. And you can be funny. I mean, I posted a funny video of me at 10 o'clock at night, Saturday night at, at a bar at the beach. And I want to go home. I'm done. <laughs> I want to go to sleep. Right. And my, my friend I was with, I was, he was laughing. He's like, why don't we stay longer? I'm like, what are we going to stay for? It's 10 o'clock at night. We dressed up. We had a couple of drinks. We goofed around. It's time to go to bed. Uh, you know, I mean, it's You're not 20 anymore. Herb. Huh? You can't do it. You're not 20 anymore. I, what is anymore. what is there at three in the morning for somebody like me? I'd, I, I'd rather be in bed now. Yeah. Um, well, I think you're touching on an important part that that I try to convey to docs who are coming online. And it's not to say that I'm perfect or I have the, the solution because I don't. There's no you know, right answer for anybody. I think that going online and, and introducing people to your world is a double-edged sword because there's something to be said still about keeping some things private, um, keeping some, some things special. Um, and also the world is very judgmental and you can't always, you're not forgiven in the same way that you are forgiven in the real world. Um, and I mean that like you could put out a tweet where you had every good intention in the world in that tweet, 
but it could be misconstrued by someone and you will find yourself, you know, profusely apologizing or having to delete your account when you really meant it with good intentions. That's just one example right. of like a road you could go down where it, it's just a bad experience and people won't forgive you because they don't know you. They don't know that you had your good intention. And that's why it's important for us to really put things in perspective and not put all our eggs into that social media basket or online basket. Yes, you can connect with people digitally. You can start projects, et cetera, but no one's going to replace the real life interactions and the humans that know us and forgive us for saying things that are stupid sometimes or can be insulting or, you know, listen to us when we say, well, I didn't mean it that way. Um, so I think we've forgotten that as humans and especially when your likes grow and you get more and more popular, you tend to like almost sometimes some people develop like a complex where they feel like this is their world. And these are the people that love them. And I think it's going to increase the rates of unhappiness. And I think it's going to increase the rates of suicide as we see actually in teams. I think this is the basis of a lot of the team suicide nowadays is just that you're, you're watching everyone else online and you're like, why are they happy and not me? And why did they get 7,000 likes and not me? Or now I have a hater, so I'm going to kill myself because that's my world is the online world. I cannot have a hater. Well, I feel very bad for young adolescent girls and young women today. Um, I mean, you look at Instagram and every woman's got a, a breast implants and they're half naked and they're in front of fancy cars or jets or going to Dubai or going to France or eating in five-star restaurants. I know, well, I, I, in, I, in my own, in my own social circle. And I, you know, uh, I'm well connected with a bunch of doctors None of us look that great and none of us are that rich that we have private jets that we can go for dinner in Dubai. Right. That well, what I think, so cannot be mad. I, I feel like on one hand, I'm actually okay with getting whatever you need to get for yourself. Like I'm okay with the changes you need to feel good about yourself, but the key is to feel good about yourself. Meaning if you want to get a breast job or if you want to go to Dubai, more power to you. And if you have enough money to do that, again, more power to you because you've many times you've earned it, right? So if we've earned the money, we're allowed to do what we want with it. We're also allowed to be happy with certain things. What worries me is what you um, do it for. So like if posting um, just is posting and you're light about it, et cetera, et cetera, it's one thing. But if you're constantly posting for attention and there's no real purpose or business sense to it, right? If it's part of a business model, um, then it, you've, you've put thought into it. You've curated that. Maybe you are doing it because you've got a business that's growing in Dubai, like a hotel business, and you are slowly, you know, influencing, et cetera. I mean, if you're strategically doing something, it's one thing. If you're doing it to get the likes and attention, you're not going to win because at some point that ends, we all get old. <laughs> we yeah. all age. My, my point is not so much about the influencer doing it that, you know, they, they, they're trying to sell something and they're trying to monetize. My point is about how this affects someone who looks at it, who, um, you know, is the, the daughter of a middle-class family who well, doesn't have those resources. And her idea now is if I can't fly to Dubai in a private jet, when I want to, I'm a loser. Okay, I, I get that. So what I say is, let's reframe that as a society, meaning it's not going to change. Like it's here. People in general, like there's there's people that are show offs in the world, right? And there's people that are humble in the world. So now with social media, you've got this tool that helps us to market. So it brings out the show offs a little more sometimes because they're self-promoting and sometimes they're promoting something else. The point is not necessarily to like, shame them, which you're not doing, but I'm saying in general, like the point of our society is to not shame those people, but maybe to educate. So for me, it's about educating society in how do we then internalize what we see? So like, to me, it's about educating from a young age about social media and about removing yourself 
from that or reminding yourself that it is kind of like a movie. Social media is a movie, just in the same way that we had to educate ourselves about movies many, many years ago when movies first came out and explain to people that, well, that monster is not a real monster. It's made up. Right. But to me, it's in the awareness and in the education of the younger generation so that that person in the middle class that cannot afford the jet to Dubai doesn't feel bad about herself and maybe even says one day I'm going to like use that as fuel to to push yourself to succeed and say, hey, one day I'm going to become a successful businesswoman or a successful doctor that can afford these things um, and not let it like put you down or make you go commit suicide because you're going awesome. Like that looks great. And maybe I will do whatever I need to, you know, so. So I think you're right. But what, what's missing in that conversation is, that, you know, you need to lead to jet with revenue. So if you want to afford that uh, jet to Dubai and that dinner in Dubai and then come back, you have to make money first. And that's, you know, that's, that's, that's become a dirty work uh, word, work to make money, be successful. Then you get the you happiness, know, not, I don't want to say the happiness, but you get to spend your money. Like you said, in whatever silly way floats your boat. I like old Mercedes. Uh, George likes guitars. Uh, you like pretty art, uh, but you work before you had that. We don't ask to have that before we put in the work. Right. So here, a very okay. important message for you. I love that you just said that. So let's use the art example or the, the surroundings you see in me as an example, right? To the outside world, it may look like I spend a ton of money on this, right? But like we discussed before we aired, I am I love estate sale shop, estate sale shopping and thrift shopping and sales. Um I do not spend a lot of money on the things that I have. It's my immigrant mentality. Um, so to the outside world, a lot of the pictures I take and the filters I use, et cetera, because I'm an eye photographer, I love designing look like they're more and gives off that impression and may make people judge me in that way. And so again, um, I, it's just, it's all in the perception and we need to remind ourselves that all is not what it seems. And I have actually an awesome story to share um, back when I was working right after residency, um, I bought a really interesting bag that I found, uh, I believe it was at TJ Maxx. Um, that's relevant to the story because I was waiting for a bus to go into the city with that bag. And um, someone from my community saw, and I guess it got back to me. She told her nanny who told my, na my kid's nanny, um, look at Donna Correa, like she's so strutting the stuff and like, oh, that bag that she has is like a $2,000 bag. Now there were no brands showing. It wasn't like one of those brands with like the brand showing on that side. It was like a unique bag that was completely, you know, different. It was like green, like furry stuff on the outside. It was really unique. She made the assumption that it cost 2000. I don't know how I didn't have $2,000. I was post-residency in the hole. And I, again, the kind of person I don't, I just personally don't spend that money. No knock on those who do, but it's like, she made that assumption. She then told someone else, right. And it was just the looks of it. Some people can make a $5 look like a million bucks, but it's in how we internalize it and interpret it. And that to me, is the important lessons that we should be educating our children is do not like step outside of the box. Do not take everything for what it seems, right? Step out of the box and think differently and reframe. How can I view this in a different way that's conducive to my happiness? If an account is showing off about their Mercedes and trips to Dubai and it bothers you and it makes you feel like less of a human, you should A, consider working on yourself and your own self-confidence and B, consider unfollowing that account. Yeah. Unfortunately, teenagers do not have the life experience that we do. 100%. And, um, they cannot make these interpretations and they see those guitars behind me as three, $4,000 Gibson totally. guitars with a $300 Epiphone. Not well, not only that, George, but they also do not see for a second 
the hard work that you put into becoming a doctor and someone that can legitimately wear a stethoscope around his neck, that's important to me too, because the word privilege flies around a lot nowadays, right? And that word is double-edged to me too. And it, it bothers me a lot of times because yes, I am privileged, but I worked hard for my life. I still work hard with my startup. Like when did I cross that line into privilege exactly? Like I, the second that I paid off my, my student loans, like I, I don't really understand that word is it, that word is almost made is used as a weapon to make people feel bad about what they've yes. earned. I, and again, I go back, we have a coaching class and I go back to what I'd say to the coaching class every day. If you're a leader, you lead with revenue, you know, and to make revenue, you got to work hard. Um, and, and that's the conversation that when people say you're privileged or why are you spending money in old Mercedes or why are you spending money on a, on a, on a handbag? Because I worked really hard through my twenties and, and thirties and forties to get here. And now I have extra money and that's what brings me happiness. Yeah. So, well, you know, so don't, I mean, you work hard too. You will be able to buy what you like. 100%. Right? Listen, we want our children to work hard and be happy, be able to provide for themselves and their family. At the end of the day, we want them happy. If it's not physical material goods, fine. Then it's trips. If it's not trips, then it's a golf, it, whatever. Maybe just, food, maybe playing golf. Yeah, exactly. Just define what's important to you and be confident about it and move forward. But and work course, hard we live it. in a capitalistic society. So I would not, not, not only not argue that money is not good, but yes, money has been made to be such a dirty word in a capitalistic society where things work for the most part. I mean, we've got our freedoms and it's, it's democracy here. I mean, some things are slowly evolving and, uh, and such, but I think capitalism works and money makes the world go round. No matter what we say, money has always made the word go around, whether it was money or back then when we used to barter and we didn't yet have money and money wasn't a concept. And, and you talked about the importance of marketing your brand. Well, you know, if you go back into the biblical times, marriages yeah. were about, you know, I'm marketing my daughter to a nice son and the families market themselves in the town. It was the dowry that you were giving. The dowry. I mean, the dowry is, is, a, is a touchy subject for a lot of people, but 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 yes, yeah. I mean, you market your daughter, and you know, we had sweet 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 sixteen parties to market our daughters, or quinceañeras, or debutante balls. Um, you know, we've always had to market ourselves to maintain what you want and is important to you. We and market an everyday concept all the time. You can tell me that you hate marketing, and I will point out something in your life that you're marketing in. We are all marketing every day. All the time. You're making, when, I, when, I'm, at, when I'm asking a parent to vaccinate their kid, I am selling. Yes, 100%. I am selling him, selling him for a good reason in the idea, if you give this shot, your kid will not have cancer. How could you say no to that? Right. We're marketing everything. We're marketing um, medicines when we feel like someone has reached a diabetic level where they can no longer try lifestyle modification. Um, we market, I sometimes say I market a breakfast or a, a salad to my child when I have to convince them that it's good, right? I market that. Um, we're marketing, yeah, we're marketing everywhere. And so should doctors consider marketing um, themselves? Absolutely. Again, if anything, for the opportunities that they may not have had come their way, had they not openly like put themselves out there and then promoted themselves. Absolutely. Um, and then I want to ask you one more question and then um, we'll, we'll call it a wrap because we've taken a lot of your time this morning. But the importance of the right photography, uh, being sharp, attention to detail. Uh, even the spelling when you're on social media, because you do a very good job of that. At slopstick, throw it out there and put it out without editing and making the sound be sharp and the video sharp. I don't think that's good for your social brand. I mean, it's not. But at the end of the day, I mean, again, it's all extremely personalized. Everyone does what they can. Um, not everyone can take great photos and not everyone can use filters the right way. And I mean, 
you do what you can. Um, it depends what aspect of your brand you want to shine. If you really are just really bad at taking photos and YouTube videos, et cetera, maybe your messaging is right on point. Maybe you've got really smart, sharp, witty remarks that you put out um, in writing that really appeals to the public. Um, maybe you just have images that are amazing, right? I mean, the world has models <laughs> and models that many times are followed because of their beauty. So everyone's got like their talent that they can hone in on. Now, can they perfect the other aspects that maybe they're weak in? Absolutely. And that's part of what we do at Sony Docs is we have lectures that I'm hoping are free to the public when they're live, where we can perfect all these aspects. Last night, I gave a talk on Canva on using Canva for marketing. It's an app. Two nights ago or three nights ago, I gave a lecture on LinkedIn and how to use it and optimize your account. I've got, you know, lectures coming up on, about Facebook, how to monetize groups on Facebook, what it is. I've got Instagram lectures, but I also have ways for doctors to lecture because again, we can always improve ourselves. We can always improve something. The question is just, what do you need improvements on? What is your weakness? Uh, what can you strengthen? Uh, I'm sorry, what can you strengthen with what lecture or with what resource? And do you have the time to strengthen it? And is there an, a return on your time investment for learning that uh, for learning that hobby or learning that skill? And, and what's your passion? What, 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 what drives you, right? Yeah, exactly. What drives you? What makes you happy? Yeah, I mean, when I mean by is there a return on your time investment? I don't just mean a financial return, I mean a personal return. So whether it's happiness, personal satisfaction, having a hobby that you're now creating, human connection, financial, et cetera, et cetera. It's amazing how, how you learned all these things as a physician, yet people go to college to learn these things and that's their job. Now why yeah, does- I, le I learned it by just- You learn anything, because you're- yeah, you can learn. Right, you can learn anything. You probably medicine is probably well. You could probably apprentice for many many years and pick up on things. I mean, yeah. we just as a society decided to define that medical school was you know you go to four years after at least in the U.S. you go four years of medical school after your undergrad and then you go to three at least three years of training. But you really can learn most things through practice, and and practice really does make perfect to some degree. Some of us don't inherently have the skill required. For example, you may not be a design guru if you do not love the arts or have that, you know, innately in you, but you can always try and perfect it a bit. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation. I, I think time's too short to uh, give it justice to everything you're doing. Um, so where can people find you? Um, so, I mean, I am uh, at Dr. Coriel across social media. My company is at SoMeDocs, S-O-M-E-D-O-C-S, SoMeDocs. What does that mean, SoMeDocs? So, SoMe is social media. It's just an acronym. S-O is social and M-E is media. And okay. then docs, doctors. So, SoMeDocs um, is the acronym uh, for doctorsonsocialmedia.com. That's the website. I've now re newly reopened somedocs.com, so you can sort of get to us through there. Uh, and a new rebranded doctors uh, networking club, which is the Facebook group that I mentioned that is for doctors only, where I'm hoping to really facilitate interactions that are more fair and are more open to people um, to truly network without worrying about the censorship and where there's actual rules everyone can follow. So it's doctorsonsocialmedia.com is the website. Subscribe, whether you're a doctor or a patient, by the way, or a business, everyone is welcome. There's something for everyone. Follow us across social media at SoMeDocs. And then me personally, I serve as advisor and such at Dr. Coriel, D-R-C-O-R-R-I-E-L. Mm -hmm. And then will you be having any live events uh, in the coming months? Yes, I, so I have both. So networking is super important to me. I host virtual networking. So anyone from any part of the US can join. Um, the next one's coming up, but it's going to be monthly. So please, if you're a doctor out there and you want to add to the Facebook group, to the doctor networking club I host, you want to add a networking like 
face-to-face -face component, consider the uh, virtual networking session. And then I am hosting a live networking in person in New York City. It's my second one coming up. I'm hoping to continue that. It just takes a lot more effort, but it's a really cool concept because it's pure schmooze without any agenda. Like there's no like lecture or conference. It's just getting together for two hours. I've rented out an art gallery. It's going to be unique because I want to make it unique. So you'll see if you come and I hope to stimulate more community imagination in my and, colleagues. And I'm sorry, when is this event? So the New York City one is coming up November 17th. I just don't know if it's relevant for people who will listen to this a year from now, but November 17th, 2022 is going to happen for doctors. You can find the invitation online uh, on doctors on social media.com for doctors. Okay. Um, and it's pretty, pretty straightforward. There's an invitation, you click in it and you join. Wonderful. That's Maybe awesome. we work together and develop a pediatric community on social media because we, this is our purpose to bring pediatricians together. Well, doctors on social media.com is a fairly large venture and within it lie all of the specialties. Yeah. So we have a pediatrics department and we're happy to bring people in that want to work with the Somedocs brand to continue building the pediatrics. I mean, I think pediatrics is probably the most, one of the more populated profiles on our website. We're, we're working slowly, but they, you know, more than happy. I think there should be communities in every specialty and we're happy to showcase them. But we have to make it bigger and explode. That's right. That would be amazing. That's what I like doing, making things explode. Right, Herb? That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that, we got to focus on leading with the revenue because the revenue is what allows us to grow and yeah. you know Absolutely. do more things and change the world. Yeah, oh, no. do the right thing and the money will follow, I told you. Yes. Well, thank you so much for your time today. This is Really, really fascinating conversation. I hope we can get together again and have another conversation and dig deeper into your design uh, passion and your networking passion. I really appreciate you having me on and thank you for the stimulating conversation. Thank you. Wish you the best of luck and hopefully we'll see each other soon. Thank you so much.